the Jews of Al-Andalus, the Muslim territory of the Iberian Peninsula, what today is Spain and Portugal, the Jews of Al-Andalus in the 10th century began to call themselves Sepharadim, after the biblical term Sepharad. Yes, they saw themselves as in the words of the prophet Ovadia, Obadiah, the words and the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Sepharad. These Sepharadim saw themselves as the creme de la creme, the nobility of the Jewish people, who, with the sad events of the destruction of the temple in the first century, only then made their way to the second homeland, to the Iberian Peninsula, to Sepharad. Their success owed much to their surroundings. Living in Muslim Al-Andalus, they were graced by being subjects of the great Khalif, Abd al-Rahman, who had declared independence from the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad, and there in Al-Andalus built a magnificent capital in the city of Cordova. In Cordova, he gathered together scholars from all over the Mediterranean and Near Eastern worlds, scholars of Islam, of the Quran, of the Hadith, poets and scientists, physicians and astronomers, grammarians, and storytellers all gathered in the city of Cordova. Abd al-Rahman as well, a far-sighted ruler, was able to establish his capital in Cordova relying not only on fellow Muslims but on other ethnic and religious groups who lived within the peninsula. Jews as well as others are able to obtain great posts under Abd al-Rahman. Yes, They've achieved much financially due to the upsurge in commerce in the Western Mediterranean. And they also are able to gain much benefit from the political and military achievements of their patron, Abd al-Rahman. Significantly for Sephardic culture and for Jewish culture in history, these Sephardic Jews follow the Muslim example just as the Muslims, the wealthy ones, and the politically connected Muslims, as well as the Khalif, gathered together scholars from all over the Mediterranean, so did the Jews. Wealthy Jews, politically connected Jews, invited Jewish scholars of the Torah, of the Talmud, poets, philosophers, physicians, and they invited them to Al-Andalus, and they supported them. They supported them while they created their great works of Jewish learning. And these wealthy Jews and politically well-placed Jews learned something from the Muslims as well. They realized that the great culture could only survive, could only flourish in the presence of great books. And as the Muslims gathered manuscripts of their traditions from all over the Mediterranean and Near Eastern world, so did the Jews. Sephardic culture began to grow apace as wealthy Sephardim patronized Jewish learning and Sephardic culture made an imprint on its surroundings. This is a wonderful time. This was the 10th century. 10th century Al-Andalus. And if we look at the map, we have to imagine the Iberian Peninsula mostly controlled by the Muslims in their territory of Al-Andalus with the Christians living in small lands in the fastnesses of the northern mountains of the peninsula. But in Cordova, in the next century, things were going to change. In the year 1009, there was a great revolt Yes, Abd al-Rahman III had ruled from the year 912 to 961. He bequeathed his kingdom to his son. But by 1009, the kingdom began to fragment. A revolt in Cordova put an end to the unified al-Andalus. No longer was there a great Muslim leader protecting his flock, but rather now within the Iberian Peninsula, the result of this revolution was 23 small little kingdoms known as Taifa kingdoms. And these small little kingdoms, all Muslim, warred with each other 
almost continually. And what about the Jews? What about the Jews who had flourished politically and economically and culturally under the Khalif? What happened to them? Fascinatingly, many of these well-placed Jews and prosperous individuals were able to secure positions within the courts of these small little Taifa kingdoms. It was an exceptional moment. These Jews were able to continue this grand and great golden age in more limited surroundings, but not necessarily with any drop-off in cultural production. Within the context of these small little kingdoms, there are a number of noteworthy Jewish leaders that stand out, and it is to them that we must pay attention. Jews were invited into these Taifa kingdoms and were able to continue with their glorious cultural production. The Jews were valued by these rulers. They knew that the Jews had no aspirations to ultimate political power. They wouldn't be allowed such positions within a Muslim government. And therefore, many Jewish families who had lived well under Abd al-Rahman, their children, descendants, flourished as well during the Taifa period. We're going to spend some time on one of the kingdoms, distinguished kingdoms at that time, in the city of Granada. Granada in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. There we come upon one of the most powerful figures that we've ever observed in Jewish history. His name was Shmuel ibn Nagrela. Shmuel ibn Nagrela was born in Cordova. He and his family with the revolution of 1009 fled to Malaga, but then finds himself in Granada working for the local king. And Shmuel ibn Nagrela was trained as a great Sephardic Jew. He was learned in the Sephardic curriculum. He knew Hebrew. He knew Arabic. He knew the Bible. He studied the Talmud. He studied grammar. He learned the Hebrew language. Shmuel ibn Agrela was a true child of the Sephardic educational system, an educational system that trained glorious intellectuals who were also capable of moving easily through in the courts of the monarchs and mixing well with Muslims and Christians. Shmuel ibn Nagrela wrote a commentary on the Talmud. Shmuel ibn Nagrela was so gutsy would be a grand word that he authored a polemic against Islam. Shmuel ibn Nagrela above all was noted as a grand poet. In fact, we are in possession of over 2,000 of Shmuel's poems. Now that coupled with the fact that he rose to the position of vizier in the kingdom of Granada. And if the later Moshe ibn Ezra's testimony is correct, Shmuel ibn Nagrela was commander-in-chief of the armies of Granada. What an extraordinary figure culturally productive, politically powerful, and militarily skilled, an individual who truly stands out in the course of Jewish history. Shmuel, through his poetry, has described for us what life was like for a Jewish courtier, constantly staying, uh, constantly having to rely on his wits, to stay abreast of political intrigue at court, of representing the Jewish community, of being an individual who is also concerned about Jews throughout the world, correspondent with the Jews in the great academies of Baghdad. Shmuel ibn Agrela was truly an exceptional individual. Shmuel's rare combination of talents could be seen when he was on the battlefield, and he wrote poetry on the battlefield. And in fact, we know that he would send his poetry home by carrier pigeon back to Granada. 
One could only imagine Shmuel ibn Agrela before setting out on a military campaign, scribbling away in his notebook, if you will. Shmuel composed some of the only military poetry which we Jews possess. Military poetry, which I must say is quite rare, which hadn't much been seen since the time of the Bible. And Shmuel would send this military ho poetry home, as I said, by carrier pigeon, generally to his son, Yehosef. One of his poems, by the way, is just absolutely extraordinary, where he asks God for forgiveness. It was time for the afternoon prayers for Mincha. And Shmuel writes that given the military involvement that he had, that he didn't have time to pray a full Mincha. Instead, scribbled a few lines, and he hoped that God would accept those lines in lieu of the afternoon prayer. I must say, despite all of scholars' research, we haven't determined what God's response was. Be that as it may, we do know a bit about Yehosef, Shmuel's son, a poet in his own right, who would get these messages from his father from the battlefield. And in fact, what Shmuel would often do is give his son homework. He would send those poems home, and he would ask his son to copy them over on better paper, clearly and cleanly, so it could be preserved for posterity. Shmuel's poetry, as I said, was filled with glorious items. He wrote religious poetry. He wrote military poetry. He wrote poetry of great religious and spiritual depth prayers which are still recited in some communities. Given the stormy political nature of his times with the 23 Taifa kingdoms constantly at war with each other, it's understandable that we would find in Shmuel's poetry as well references to great political intrigue, infighting in the court, the wars between the various Muslim governments, and even the jealousy of some of the Jews within his community to his high and exalted position. If you read his poetry and read it carefully, one imagines a Shmuel with great cultural, political, and military success, but a great individual who is beset upon en by enemies both, both within and without. Jews who looked askance at such a successful co-religionist, and Muslims who entertain suspicions as well of how a Jew could possibly be trusted uh, by the great rulers in Granada. Probably one of Shmuel's greatest accomplishments was that he died of natural causes in the year 1056. Yehosef, Shmuel's son, succeeds him in the position of vizier of Granada. A very successful man but apparently 10 years after his ascension to his position, in the year 1066, Yehosef makes a wrong move. We don't know the details, but in the political intrigue, Yehosef has a misstep, and Yehosef is killed. But what strikes the historian is not simply that Yehosef dies, but in the wake of the murder of Yehosef, son of Shmuel Hanagid, 300 Jews are killed in the streets of Granada. And that gives us pause. How golden was this golden age that we've been speaking about? If in the wake of Yehosef's murder, almost all the Jews of Granada are massacred. But after pausing for a moment and ref some reflection, we gain insight on what it really was to be successful in the Golden Age, and why the Jews did rise to such great heights. The reason why Muslim rulers could rely upon the Jews, the reason why Muslim rulers would sometimes choose Jews even over their co-religionists, was precisely as we said before, because the Jews they knew had no pretension to the ultimate political power. And there was a second reason as well. As a member of a minority group, if you were a vizier, you knew that not only 
did you have to behave well because your life lay in the balance, but you had the fate of all the Jews within your kingdom in your hands. You knew with one misstep you not only harmed yourself, but you harmed your own Jewish community. It's with that perspective we go back to Shmuel's poetry. And when he writes seemingly boastfully, I am the David of my generation, referring to King David, and we smirk to ourselves and wonder how Shmuel could imagine himself as the great King David, we also understand. And what we understand is that Shmuel knew well that just as King David in an earlier period, the success of the Israelite people lay within his hands, Shmuel realized as well that his success, his success in the Taifa kingdoms, his success with his king was crucial, not only for his and his family's health, but the health of the Jewish people. With these warring kingdoms, these warring Taifa kingdoms, not presenting a unified front to the Christians in the peninsula, the great political drama of the Iberian Peninsula begins to embark on a new era. If you look at the map, with the great Al-Andalus split into 23 kingdoms, and the Christians pretty much up north, with the squabbling going on amongst the Muslims, the Christians begin to take advantage. They begin to conquer further south, taking very important pasture, pasture, pasture lands and agricultural lands away from the Muslims. And then, in the year 1085, an extraordinary moment. In the year 1085, the city of Toledo is conquered. And the reason why that's crucial is because Toledo, as we remember, was the capital of the Visigoths. When the Christians conquer Toledo in 1085, they no longer see it as a little, small-time skirmish between themselves and the Muslims, but they imagine now they could, they could reconquer that great Visigothic kingdom that fell in 711 to the Muslim armies. With the conquest of Toledo in the year 1085, the Christians imagined that the entire peninsula was within their grasp and they began to look at their skirmishes with the Muslims, as I said, as not being small-time battles, but rather they were involved in great and holy work, nothing less than the reconquest of the entire peninsula under Christian rule. In fact, they named their warlike endeavors the Reconquista, the Reconquest. Christians imagined that they were taking back the peninsula that was rightfully theirs. In fact, in the late 11th century, the notion of crusade began to emerge within Western Europe, and for the Christians of the Iberian Peninsula, the Reconquista was nothing less than a crusade on their own soil. They needed not to go to Jerusalem and recapture the holy city for Catholicism, but rather it would be their holy work simply to recapture the peninsula for the Christian forces. This was quite an unsettled time. Christians now being victorious, the Muslims being thrown into disarray, the Muslims attempting, attempting some sort of unity, but not easily found. The Muslims turned to North Africa, where they originally came from, and to the great Berber tribes, the Almoravides. And they ask these Almoravides, the term comes from the Arabic Almuravitun, men of the fortress, to cross over from North Africa, cross into the Iberian Peninsula, and help them reestablish the hegemony of Al-Andalus, help them push back the Christians. The Almoravides come, and they do help the Muslims. Yes, the Christians are being pushed back. Ah, but victory is not 
within anyone's grasp. There is battling back and forth between Christians and Muslims. And what about our Jews? What about our Jews? They're caught between two great regional powers, between Christianity, Western Christendom, and between Islam from the south and from the east. And what are the Jews going to do? Islam isn't the same anymore for them. In those great times of Abd al-Rahman, of al-Andalus seem so far distant. And these Almoravides from North Africa who have come to help the Muslims are not generous to people who are not of the Islamic faith. They are not like Abd al-Rahman who treat the people of the book with generosity, who allow them positions within the government, who allow Jewish culture to thrive. So no longer is there a host Islam which welcomes the Jewish people. And where should the Jews go? Can they go to Christian lands? What would Christian lands be like? Did they remember the Visigothic period and the forced conversions? Perhaps not. But there was no record for them that the Christians of the Iberian Peninsula would welcome them. There are three authors, Jewish authors, who wrote much during this period and then during the next few generations that give us an insight into what the Jewish people must have been thinking about. What did these proud Sephardim imagine? The great poet Moshe ben Ezra in the 11th century, he has to leave Granada. His family loses his position with the onset of the Almoravides. Moshe ibn Ezra spends most of his life wandering through the peninsula, sad, thinking about that lost, wonderful land of Al-Andalus, wondering if he will ever be able to go home again, recapture the lost glory. He wanders through Muslim lands and Christian lands, and in Christian lands, he laments the fact that he's among the tongue-tied that Christian culture was not as advanced as Muslim culture at that time. And Moshe ben Ezra, caught between Christianity and Islam, just imagines the lost glory of Al-Andalus. His young protege, Yehuda Halevi, born at the end of the 11th century, either in the city of Toledo, the newly conquered Christian city, or in Tudela, further north under Islam, Yehuda Halevi, who was brought up again as Moshe ibn Ezra was and Shmuel Hanagid was, with a glorious Sephardic education where a cultured Jew learned languages and literature, religious works as Bible and Talmud and philosophy and sciences. Yehuda Halevi is very successful. Unlike his mentor Moshe ibn Ezra, he is able to achieve positions both in Muslim territory and in Christian lands as well. He moves easily across frontiers. And Yehuda Halevi is not only a great courtier, but Yehuda Halevi as well is a glorious poet. Comedic poetry, elegiac poetry, poetry of weddings, poetry for the, the sad funerals that he had to go of those friends who passed away. Yehuda Halevi writes songs about Zion, songs about friendship. Yehuda Halevi was a true child of the Golden Age and surprises, surprises all of his contemporaries with that at the age of 60, the late age, with Christians and Muslims fighting over Al-Andalus, Yehuda Halevi decides to go on a personal pilgrimage to Eretz Yisrael, to the Holy Land. Yes, a period where the Crusaders are marching on Jerusalem, where the Christian Crusaders in Iberia are attempting to wrest the land back from the Muslims. Yehuda Halevi writes that glorious poem where he clearly sets out that a Jew watching Christians and Muslims fight wonders where is his place. 
And Yehuda Halevi gave his own personal religious answer, and that was to leave the Iberian Peninsula, leave his great success, and travel to the land of Israel. We'll conclude today's talk with paying attention to a less heralded writer, to Abraham ibn Daud. Abraham ibn Daud, you might remember, was the one who wrote about the story of the four captives and the emergence of Sephardic culture in the Iberian Peninsula. Abraham ibn Daud, who lived a number of years after both Moshe ibn Ezra and Yehuda Halevi, faced the same question, the same question Jews were asking. Where are they going to find rest? Islam has turned against them in the peninsula. The Christians, are they truly hospitable to the Jews? And for most Jews, Yehuda Halevi's personal pilgrimage was not a pilgrimage that they could imagine for themselves. Yehuda Halevi, given his wealth and his connections, was able to travel to the land of Israel. In fact, stopping off in Alexandria in Egypt where he was celebrated, that's how successful he was. For Abraham, the answer was clear. He tells us in his book, Sefer Kabbalah, that the courtier class, the successful Jews, are now being employed by the Christian monarchs. The same great Alfonso VI of Castile who conquered the city of Toledo in the year 1085, Alfonso the Emperador, Abraham Ibn Daud tells us, is able to engage a Jewish courtier to work alongside him. And who is this Jewish courtier? None other than Yehuda Hanasi Ibn Ezra, a member of the great Ibn Ezra family of Granada. And for Abraham Ibn Daud, the lesson is clear. Sephardic Jews, yes, will have to move, will have to move from the Muslim-dominated peninsula and head north to Christian territory. What he promises his co-religionists is that the Christians are going to be helpful to the Jews, who will draw them into their lands, who will give them a place to live, and most importantly for Ibn Daud, will grant significant positions to the courtier class. So in their aid to the Christian monarchs, they will also be able to look out for the Jews who've now traveled with them into Christian lands.